Welcome back to the playlist on glycolysis. So what we've been doing in the past few videos is we've been talking about ATP hydrolysis. We've mentioned how glucose can get into cells, but now we're actually going to find out what happens when glucose actually does get into the cell cytosol. So this glycolytic playlist is all about glycolysis. And where does glycolysis occur? Well, it occurs in the cytosol. So all 10 reactions of glycolysis, they all exist in the cytosol. There's no nuclear reactions that occur. There's no mitochondrial reactions. It's all cytosolic, okay? And that goes for hexokinase. So in the last video, we actually looked at how glucose gets into the cell. And as soon as the glucose gets into the cell, within nanoseconds, it's going to get phosphorylated by this enzyme, a very important enzyme in glycolysis, called hexokinase. Okay, and hexokinase is important for several reasons. Number one, it is basically one of the committed steps. It is one of the committed steps in glucose metabolism. Okay, so if you're going to synthesize glycogen, you've got to use this enzyme. Okay, because glycogen ultimately comes from glucose 1-phosphate, which comes from glucose 6-phosphate over here, and that obviously comes from glucose as shown through this reaction. So if you're synthesizing glycogen, you've got to use hexokinase. If you're going to catabolize glucose, you're going to have to use this enzyme. So this is also, this reaction marks the first step in the catabolism of glucose, okay? Also, if you want to use something called the pentose phosphate pathway, which is basically how you synthesize NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate, which is important for DNA and RNA synthesis, you've got to use this enzyme. Okay? So what you can essentially think of is glucose 6-phosphate really, really and truly is a branch point in many pathways. Okay, so the glucose 6-phosphate can go into the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, the glucose 6-phosphate can continue on in glycolysis, the catabolism of glucose through the enzyme phosphoglucoisomerase, or it can actually go and synthesize glycogen, whereby glucose 6-phosphate reacts with phosphoglucomutase to give glucose 1-phosphate, and then that gets polymerized. So glucose 6-phosphate is the branch point, very important to understand. And the way we get it from glucose is by using hexokinase. So when the glucose gets into the cell, within nanoseconds, it's going to get phosphorylated. So that's what we're essentially doing in this reaction. So I want to have you understand the intuition behind this. Whenever we have an O-phosphorylase, so this is what we call an O as in oxygen, an O-phosphorylase, or in some level you could call it an O-kinase, okay, as in the name hexokinase, we're essentially replacing this proton right here on the C6 hydroxyl group we're replacing it with this phosphoryl group. Okay, so this group right here, this is called a phosphoryl group. We're going to do almost the same thing in phosphofructokinase 1, which is the third step in glycolysis. Okay, so we're actually going to look at the catalytic mechanism of hexokinase in just a few minutes. But I just want to have you understand that intuition, that essentially what's happening is we're taking off this proton right here, and then we're ultimately going to get out um, a phosphorylated version of glucose, which is glucose 6-phosphate. And just like in most phosphoryl group transfers, the phosphate donor is adenosine triphosphate, and you would imagine that, of course, we would get out adenosine diphosphate. Hexokinase is also an allosteric enzyme, and we're not going to go over the allosteric regulation of hexokinase in this video. That will be saved for the glycolysis allosteric video. Okay, but make sure to keep a keep a watch on that. So now that we've we've talked a little bit about hexokinase and what it's for, I want to talk a little bit about how the enzymatic reaction works. So this picture up here we'll come back to in just a minute. But like I said, we're going to take glucose, which is shown right here. This is glucose. And this molecule up here is called adenosine triphosphate, as shown right here. Adenosine triphosphate, you'll usually see it referred to as ATP. Okay. Notice that if we look at its structure, it has the adenine nitrogenous base. It has the 
ribose ring, and then it has three phosphates that are attached to the five prime position of the ribose ring. Okay, an ATP is going to be allowed into one region of the active site. Okay, and there actually is more to just binding to the enzyme in the strategy. Actually, there are some residues and metal cations that actually stabilize the ATP in the active site. For example, these outer two, let me do this in red, these outer two phosphates, the beta, this is the beta phosphate, and this is the gamma phosphate, these two phosphates have negative charges, and we talked a lot about the implications of that in a previous video, but the magnesium that's in the active site, so this is a magnesium 2 plus uh, dependent enzyme, the magnesium forms electrostatic interactions with the negative charges on these two phosphates. And so by forming the electrostatic interactions, I think we all know from Coulomb's law that if you have two charges that are opposite in opposite in, in direction, then they will attract each other. And so the magnesium is attracting the two phosphates, and that's part of the strategy in getting ATP to bind to the enzyme because the magnesium is bound to the enzyme. If magnesium is able to interact favorably with those negative charges on the phosphates, it will facilitate binding. And so I've drawn the electrostatic interactions here in yellow. Also, there's a positively charged residue in the active site called an arginine residue. That's shown right here. This is an arginine residue. And the guanidinium group of arginine has a positive charge. And it interacts electrostatically with instead this phosphate right here, which is actually the alpha phosphate. Okay, So the alpha phosphate has a negative charge, and it likes to interact electrostatically with the arginine residue. These two residues combined facilitate the binding of ATP to the enzyme and allow the reaction to take place very quickly. Okay, It turns out that hexokinases is one of the faster enzymes in nature, and part of the strategy in getting it to be so fast is to... Um, facilitate ATP binding by using these electrostatic interactions favorably. So now in the enzyme we have this ATP that's bound. We have a glucose in there. Now we're going to phosphorylate it. So some things to know. There's a critical aspartate residue in the active site and I'll draw the mechanistic steps in green. So this aspartate is going to deprotonate the C6 hydroxyl group. So this is this is C6 on glucose. It's going to deprotonate that and then you're going to get the, this bond right here is going to break and you're going to get nucleophilic attack on the gamma phosphate of ATP. And that's going to generate a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate as shown right here on the right. Now whenever I say trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, what you'll most likely hear it referred to is a pentavalent intermediate. And the reason it's pentavalent is because this phosphorus right here, which I'll circle in purple, that phosphorus atom has five bonds. Recall that phosphorus is below the second period on the periodic table, and so it's able to violate the octet rule. It's able to have five bonds. And so this intermediate has phos phosphorus with five bonds. But just like in the case of nucleophilic acyl substitutions that you talked about in organic, this is going to be a nucleophilic phosphoryl substitution. So you, you would imagine that the, the phosphoryl group is going to collapse back down. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So this phosphorus-oxygen double bond is going to reform. And that's going to force a leaving group to leave. Okay, So it's, it's just like we saw in nucleophilic acyl substitutions in organic. You have nucleophilic attack, generation of some kind of intermediate. In that case, it was tetrahedral. And then you get loss of a leaving group. So the same thing is going to apply here. You get nucleophilic attack by glucose C6 hydroxyl group, generation of a pentavalent intermediate, the phosphoryl group is going to collapse back down, and then you're going to get loss of a leaving group, which it turns out is this group right here, and it comes out and it reabstracts the proton from this aspartic acid in the active site. And of course, that regenerates deprotonated aspartate. And then what you get at the end of this reaction sequence is number one, a phosphorylated glucose or glucose 6-phosphate, and then you get adenosine diphosphate, and it will, of course, lose this proton to solution when it leaves the active site. Okay, so hopefully that mechanism made a little bit of sense. I want to talk a little bit about the enzyme function very quickly. Um, this enzyme adopts a conformation known as the closed conformation.
this little group right here that you see, let me do that in a different color, something that you can see a little bit easier. Let me do black. So this, this group that you see right here, this is the C6OH group. Okay, and what you'll actually see is the ATP is going to bind sort of in this region right there. Okay, and when I say that hexokinase adopts a closed conformation, remember that if you have if you have water around ATP, it has the potential to hydrolyze. And we talked a little bit in the last video about how ATP sort of gets around that by using the negatively charged oxygens to shield nucleophiles. But it's not to say it won't happen. So to prevent ATP hydrolysis in the active site, the glucose is going to be sort of in this hole right here. And when the enzyme adopts a closed conformation, it excludes water. Okay? Meaning that what happens is all the water is essentially forced out of the active site. And so now this C6 hydroxyl group is only in contact with adenosine triphosphate, and that facilitates the phosphoryl group transfer. Okay? They've actually done studies where instead of having this glucose in here with the C6 hydroxyl group, they put a different carbohydrate, which actually does exist. It's a real carbohydrate called xylose. Okay? Notice that in xylose... Let me do this in, I'll do this in purple. This carbon right here doesn't have the hydroxymethyl group on it, right? This group right here, this is referred to as a hydroxymethyl. Let me write that down. This is called a hydroxy, a hydroxymethyl group. Notice that group is absent on xylose. So what ends up happening is in the closed conformation, this group right here in xylose is no longer there. And so what happens is, is water sort of slips through this hole and it's actually able to hydrolyze the ATP into phosphate and ADP. Okay, so part of the genius in the design of this enzyme is to have this hole here where glucose 6-phosphate C6OH group can sort of stick through and the, the phosphoryl group transfer from ATP can occur very smoothly without hydrolysis of ATP. So what ends up happening is when the enzyme adopts the closed conformation, it excludes water and forces it out of the active site. Okay, so hopefully that made a little bit of sense. And now we've seen the mechanism on how that occurs. Before we go, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the implications of this enzyme and why you have it. Um, there are actually some textbooks out there and some sources that might not, might not actually consider this one of the enzymes of glycolysis. Um, certainly it's required for glycolysis, but here's the idea. The idea is that um, glucose in very large amounts in the blood can do damage to cells. Okay, so we talked about in the last video how you get glucose into cells. And if you have lots of glucose in the blood, of course you're going to have insulin present in a healthy individual. Um, and you don't want lots of glucose in the blood because it can cause damage to cells. Um, it's very well known that you can get, um, you can go blind from lots of glucose in the blood, and there's all sorts of other maladies that can occur. So you've got to get it into the cells, and you've got to get it to stay in the cells. That's the key. Um, there are actually transporters that can move glucose back out into the blood. Okay, and you don't want that to happen. Once you have the glucose in the cell, you sort of want to keep it there. Okay. Now, one thing you should realize about the cell membrane, think back to the cell membrane physiology and what can cross it, phosphates cannot cross the cell membrane. There aren't any transporters for those. Okay. Um, remember from when we studied resting membrane voltage that whenever you had phosphate, which was the intracellular buffer, there weren't any transporters or facilitated diffusion transporters or anything like that to move phosphates across. And that's the same thing for glucose 6-phosphate. You have glucose transporters that can re 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 basically reverse the reaction, take glucose back out into the blood, but there are no transporters for glucose 6-phosphate. So once you phosphorylate glucose, it's stuck in the cell and now it's committed towards glucose metabolism, whether that be the pentose phosphate pathway as shown right here, where you generate NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate, whether you catabolize it into pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, or you can basically turn it into glycogen. So once you do this reaction, you're committed to doing basically one of those three things. 
And that's the genius of the design. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. And in the next video, we're actually going to look at phosphoglucoisomerase and its mechanism. See you in the next video.